This is Bringing the Backups with Eric Helwig. Oh, fuck you, listeners. How's everybody doing? Welcome to Bringing the Backups. Is that a good way to start the show, just telling people to fuck off? That is how I feel. I had a bad week, all right? And we're going to get to it, but I don't want to take up your time with my bullshit. We got to get to the business of the podcast. That's why you guys listen. It's not for my personality, like some people say. It's because you really care about the backup quarterbacks that I randomly select. And this week we got Sage Rosenfels. Oh, man, Sage Rosenfels, this dude. This dude was very mediocre, as pretty much everybody on the podcast is. And I'm, I mean, I, when I was reading about Sage, the first thing I connected with, four siblings. I have five siblings. So I'm like, this guy's, this guy's been through some stuff that I've been through, which I can appreciate. He uh, went to Iowa State, which also, I, I like Iowa State because it's like a shitty big school. I don't like rooting for the big teams in the Power Five, but if it's somebody who, like, just gets their ass kicked. I remember reading something about he won a bowl game in 2000. It was the first time they'd won a bowl game in 108 years, which is fucking hilarious. Just imagine being a fan of a team that hasn't won any major game for 108 years. That's generations of your family just watching a team get its ass kicked. Very, very relatable. And also, I'm talking like I don't root for a, a football team that's been horrible. I root for Army football. Yeah, it's no, it's very bad. Who made that us sound? The, the guest is not here, audience, okay? that's I just want you to know that was uh, – uh, it was Gordon. That's who it was. This week's guest, Alex Getlin, is not sitting four feet away from me waiting for me to bring him in, all right? That's not what it is. I swear on my life that's not what it is. And on the life of anyone I love. <laughs> it includes my dog. It includes my wife. This is definitely getting cut. There's no way that's staying in the show. <laughs> that's a horrible thing I just said. No, I like Army football. And it's they run the triple option offense from uh, the playbook is from 1903. Watching the triple option offense is like watching ice melt in a cup that's slightly below freezing. It takes <laughs> – the average drive goes about 45 minutes. The game takes exactly one hour to play. It's basically just n- trying to not play football. So anyway, what I'm saying is I definitely am with Sage Rosenfels, a kid who's, I believe, from Iowa. I believe he's from Iowa. And when I say I believe, I mean I have no fucking idea where he's from. It, this, it's just easier for the conversation if that's where he's from. But that is coming straight out of my ass. But let's assume he's from Iowa. He went to Iowa State. And they had some success with him, right? He goes 8-3 and three in his senior year, 2000. He's rated the second-best quarterback in the draft that year, even though his college numbers are really bad. I actually pulled him up here. Let me take a look at this right here. Sage Rosenfeld's college. He threw 18 touchdowns and 26 interceptions. He completed 52% of his passes. How was he the second best quarterback in the year 2000? I, I don't know. I, I, that does not make any sense to me. I mean, maybe people were having like, like had a premonition that 9 11 was going to happen in a couple of months and were just playing poorly, but he seemed, he apparently was horrible in college, but somehow got drafted, gets drafted by the Washington Redskins. All right, plays for Mar- Marty Schottenheimer, Marty Ball. Run on first down, run on second down, punt on third down. Marty Ball doesn't play a snap, which is going to be a theme throughout his career as he is, again, not very good. Second year goes to Miami. He ends up in Miami for four years, plays for Dave Wonstadt for the first three years. And then Nick Saban, our boy, Alabama, Nick Saban, comes in to play with Sage. And I'll say that season, that's 2005, so now his fifth year in the season, fourth season in Miami. Sage has, like, the like he starts a game, gets into four games, and has a couple pretty memorable games in 2005. And I'm going to go through these because, again, the reason you listen to this podcast is not for my personality. It's, it's not. Again, I'm not talking to the comic right now. I'm just yelling at the wall like I normally do. 2005. 
Rosenfels comes back against the Bills in week 13. That's what it was. He threw three fourth quarter, or no, they've had, they scored three touchdowns in the fourth quarter. He threw two touchdowns and they won. Amazing. Then two weeks later, comes in against the Jets, week 15, again relieving Gus Farratt. That's the dude who gave himself a concussion, ramming his head against the cement wall after he threw a touchdown. One of my favorite injuries of all time. Gus Farratt, that, that's a YouTube worthy search right now. Gus Farratt injures own head. Highly recommend it. Replaces Gus Farratt, does the same thing against the Jets. I know that because I uh, YouTubed the, uh, the clips that like pop up on uh, Monday Night Primetime. And it's Chris Berman. He keeps calling uh, the quarterback, Sage Rosenfels, Drew Rosenhaus. Like, that's the agent. I think Chris Berman knows two Jews, and he confuses their names on every time he does highlights. So he's like, Drew Rosenhaus throws a touchdown pass to whoever the fuck. But yeah, Rosenfels plays very well, but then he gets traded in 2006. He goes to Houston, plays for Gary Kubiak for three years. He goes 6-4 and four in 10 starts over the course of three seasons, which is, again, right down the middle of the plate for this podcast, right? Mediocre quarterback, 6-4 and four as a starter, we'll take it. That's what you want. That t- that's like peak backup, you know? You look, think of Tom Brady peak. He's throwing 85 touchdowns for nine seasons in a row. Peak backup is six and four over three seasons. Well done, Sage. Ties an NFL record in one of the craziest games I've ever seen, which if you, uh, by the way, you should, if you guys want to see what the things I'm talking about, instead of just hearing my, my beautiful radio voice, subscribe on YouTube because I... Uh, stupidly cull all the highlights from these quarterbacks together to try to make like an homage to their careers. And so far, 15 of you are watching every week. So motherfuckers, I'm not going to do that for much longer unless you start subscribing to my page. And this is going to lead into why I'm, I'll just say why I'm pissed now. Fuck Sage Rosenfels. All right. One of my friends on Facebook did, they posted, they're like, Hey, send me your YouTube links. I want to subscribe to my friends pages. So I'm like, okay, and I I send the link. I just post my link, and then a bunch of people start commenting, and they're like, hey, follow my link. I'll follow you back. I'm like, okay. So it's like a follow for follow thing, which I've – I don't know if YouTube's considered social media, but fucking 50 people follow me. Like my page goes up above 100 subscribers, which it was at like five a couple months ago when I started it. I was like, oh, this is awesome. And yeah, granted, a lot of the people, like, this is like an old person I did improv with, so it's a lot of, like, musical theater kids singing to each other over Zoom and shit like that. Like, my algorithm's basically having a nervous breakdown. Like, what the fuck are you watching? It's a lot of horrible comedy and, uh, you know, people talking about finding out they're gay. So that was, that's what my thread is. But I subscribed to everybody's page. I'm like, I don't care. Like, I'll watch new shit. Like, to me, that's healthy. Like, throw a wrench into the fucking eye of Sauron like staring at us, taking all of our data. Yeah, fuck you. Maybe I just, it definitely whoever's monitoring my YouTube thinks I am gay now. I just discovered I was gay yesterday. I get 50 subscribers. Like I said, I go, I think I went from like 80 to 125 or something. Wake up this morning, I'm back down to 94. These motherfuckers unfollowed me in the night. They followed to get, because you can't tell. Who's following? Like, like that's not, YouTube doesn't have that capability. So these fucking theater kids screwed me. I only ended up with like nine followers. Unbelievable. You know, you think of like when you're a kid and you're like the football kids are the bullies <laughs> and the theater kids are just like, they're just these warm hearted people. They're fucking assholes too. They were just skinnier and shorter when they were kids. That's it. They're bullies the same way everybody else is a bully. I am fired up. Bring in the backups. I got fucked. I got fucked. Oh. I, this is what I woke up to. This, this is why I'm mad, all right? This, I, I, literally, I'm recording this. It's 11 a.m. I found this out an hour and a half ago. I already had scheduled the podcast. I probably should have done some fucking yoga or something and chilled out before I started recording. But you know what? Never, I mean... Never again. Like the next time somebody posts something like that, I'm going to post a gif of a monkey taking a shit or something. Like I'm never. 
going to put myself in a position to be this let down by fucking kids singing Adina Menzel to each other, pretending to like my stand for five seconds, and then unfollowing me in the night. Jesus, like the like they're fucking... Like George Washington sneaking across the river to kill those people during the revolution. What was that attack? I'm, I'm not talking to myself. Again, Alex Getlin not sitting right across from me for the ease of editing. He's not here. But Alex, if you were here, what was the name of that battle? You remember that where George Washington sneaks across the river? The that Delaware. That could be it. I know the story. I don't know the name of the battle. Okay. Great. Now pretend like you're not here for another 10 minutes while I get through this Sage Rosenfeld shit. But yeah, anyway, whatever. What was I, I don't even remember where I was. Gary Kubiak. Oh, no, no, no. I remember what I wanted to talk about. So there's a game that's the Texans and the Titans. This is in, uh, what year is this? Ooh. Want to th- say 08? 07 or 08? The Texans are down 32 to 7 in the fourth quarter. Sage Rosenfeld throws four touchdown passes in the fourth quarter, which is an all-time NFL record, ties the record. They get two onside kicks at the end of the game. Like, they get an onside kick, it gets penalized. Then they do it again, get the kick a second time, throw a Hail Mary, go up, and then the Titans get the ball with 30 seconds left. They throw basically a Hail Mary, get in field goal range, and Rob Baronis... How about a weird throwback name? Rob Baronis kicks his eighth field goal of the game, also an NFL record, Titans win. And I think there's something beautiful about a backup quarterback coming in, having a fucking insane game. He didn't even start the game. It was a shop, gets injured. Rosenfels comes in. He also threw two interceptions that were terrible. (laughs) Did you really see why this guy is not very good when you watch the highlights? I mean, he sucks. But whatever, he hit a cheat code in the game he was playing and somehow threw four touchdowns in five minutes, brought them all the way back, and then it doesn't happen at the end. Tough sledding for Sage Rosenfels, but that's a game I recommend the the highlights if you want to see Chris Berman confusing the only two Jewish men he knows. You can Google Titans-Texans. I want to say 07. I think it's 07. Might be 08, but you know. Again, there's 15 of you watching the YouTube video, so how about you just go fuck yourself instead? Oh, so that's pretty. That's basically the end for him. I mean, after 2008, he goes Minnesota, Giants, Dolphins, back to Minnesota over the course of three years, and his only action was taking a knee three times in 2010 behind Eli Manning and holding field goals, which is important. You know, someone's got to hold them. The one job I could do. You just put the ball down and then close your eyes and hope somebody doesn't take your finger off. That's actually not true. It does take probably a lot of uh, hand-eye coordination to catch the ball from the center. So, you know, again, I'm full of it. But I feel like if there was a job in the NFL that I could learn to do, it would be that job. I would just be the worst placeholder in NFL history. But I would still, you know, they'd, they'd make a couple. I mean, the kicker would have to just really be kicking way above his head to do that. Oh, I also thought it was fun. I wrote down the receivers he threw touchdowns to. David Anderson, Kevin Walter, Jeff Puttitzer, and Andre Davis. Look at those throwbacks to that old game that he had against the Titans. Once he got out of football, I got to say, I'm always, it's always cool to have guys on the show that did something cool with their life after football. Because usually it's like they disappear for five years to deal with their addiction to painkillers. And then, uh, you know, they hopefully survive their suicide attempt. And then they work in real estate (laughs) or they coach at their old high school football team. That's usually what happens. Car dealerships. That's a thing. Car dealerships is a thing. Uh, It's like, and it's weird. It's like in the NFL, it's car dealerships. In the NBA, it's car washes. But like the, I say that I'd say those are like the two most common what probably. Hmm? What do baseball players do? What do baseball players do? I don't know. I, I can only think of Lenny Dykstra, and he got like a federal indictment for embezzling money. But I don't think that's normal. Right, yeah. I feel like baseball play. I here's what I think baseball players do. I think baseball players go into uh, broadcast announcing a lot more because there's so many like like teams. 
Yeah, like like there's so many jobs in baseball. It's like it's kind of like the military budget. It's like they just it's so inflated with yeah. just crap that nobody needs. So like if you can put two sentences together, I think you have a job, you know, talking about the Burlington Bees. Dude, that's how you know baseball is like the least important of all these sports. It's like just let them play. Somebody will mosey by and watch it. I don't know. It's like I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's called a pastime. It's not even a sport. It's America's pastime. Yeah, I've said before, it's like uh, it's America's pastime because it's people pretending to work. Right, exactly. So that's why it's yeah. America's sport America. is because it's it's literally like watching somebody just go to a day job. All right, so let's so let, I want to talk about what Sage did after his uh, his NFL career, which is impressive. He's a writer for the Athletic Minnesota, which I have the Athletic on my phone. I I love those guys, friends of the show, the Athletic. Give me a call for a sponsor. Ship deal sponsorship deal. Why did I say that so weird? I like made that two words. I made that two sentences. I was like sponsor, beat, ship. He calls Iowa State games as a color analyst, which is great. I actually, it's funny. I was like looking up his clip. It said Sage Rosenfell highlights. It was like the first thing that pops up on YouTube. I clicked it. It was him talking. Like he has more highlights as an announcer than he does as a player. <laughs> made me laugh a little bit. Uh, he's one of 67 Jewish players to ever play in the NFL. That number's not exact because I just counted. Um, so I don't know. That could be wrong. And then he – now he's a stand-up comedian. I saw this. Isn't that crazy? So, Alex uh, – well, you know, if, I, I, as – okay, look, guys, I, I was lying. Alex is here. How but before he before he officially comes in on the podcast, I need to give this guy – a true intro, okay, because he deserves it. He really does. Uh, and I want to say, too, I appreciate you coming in last minute. The original guest for this podcast was going to be Drew Brees, but he shattered his clavicle. So Alex was actually our backup guest, but he was able to make it in. Uh, Alex, is uh, he hosts the podcast Let Me Be Clear, which is an amazing show where he talks in detail about his political views, which are, I guess, centrist, libertarian, and make sure he will never work in a writer's room in Hollywood. Yeah, good. And then he also hosts <laughs> House Rules with his wife, Rachel, which is a very funny show as well, which I've listened to. I see clips of it on Instagram all the time. So, uh, yeah, Alex, welcome into the show, man. How are you doing? Good. Do you want to turn up my volume? I think I'm- yeah, I probably should turn up your yeah, volume. Yeah, there we go. I mean, it's up to you. It's your show. But, I uh, want to keep you down. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> By the way, if you guys, I'm going to plug, let me be clear real quick. It was previously called Thin the Herd. It was more yeah. of a funny, silly show, and just I've kind of gravitated into that, like, political realm. Like you said, I don't identify with any party. They're all idiots to me, mm-hmm. but I just give my take on it. But all the old episodes of Thin the Herd are still up, so your episode is there. We, you know, talk about your That's AGT right. appearance and all that fun stuff. So, you guys can, it, so listeners of this, if you just type in Eric Helwig or if you sift through the – old episodes you'll find it it's there um what a professional cross promotion pitch that was you had that ready to go man i was that's i'm actually hosting another podcast a friend has one and she asked me to fill in and host it so i'm literally leaving straight from here going to another one so really yeah nice man and i have a new podcast coming out in january that i'm partnered with the cannabis company on and they're like basically funding me to do it and then put their branding on it so i have a lot of you know so I say, fuck the writers' room, man. I don't care. Just, I'm all in on. <laughs> I'm just fucking. No, with I you, know. Man. But you're you're totally right. That's true. Of course, yeah. yeah. I'm. This is me making sure I'll never get hired yeah. for a job. Are you? Um, you have. So you're gonna have three podcasts. Correct. How do you have enough time to annoy your family by not taking a solid position on what's going on in the country? How do you oh, find man. the time to piss off everyone you know and love? Because that's I, what I've been doing. In every conversation I have. I think people. it I think it drives me. Bit. I will say, honestly, what's funny. So Rachel and I, we talk about a lot of – we talk about a lot of things in our uh, show we do together, House Rules. But a lot of it now gravitates into what's going on in the country and issues and stuff. And it's funny because she's like – she gets really frustrated at me sometimes because – we have different views on certain things, and I'll just, like, hit her with, like, facts, 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 facts. and then Yeah, so- which always works, by the way. People <laughs> right. love that. And I'm just – because I'm really good at, like, m- retaining certain information. And she- But she'll say – she's like, you have forced me to actually educate myself. Like, she's like, I know how I feel emotionally, but because I want to, like, be able to go back and forth with you, I have to do, like, the hard research – about certain issues and stuff. So it's just, you know. Sure, yeah. Um, but, yes, I annoy the shit out of her. And 
a lot of my friends, I can tell they're just like, can we just talk about something else? I'm like, that's, f- that's fine. I don't, if you want to go, I'll talk about yeah. it. If not, we can talk about Breaking Bad or something. I don't care. No, I've, I, 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 I don't know. I don't really get into politics too yeah, much yeah, on this sure. show, but like, I mean, I'll just say generally speaking, my, my politics are basically that whoever I'm talking to, yeah. I get annoyed at a certain point and sure. I've memorized enough facts to annoy them. Mm. And I'm like, let me see if I can Smart. make this conversation suck enough so that someone else changes the subject. And what I'm, what I'm getting better at doing is just going like, let's talk about something else. Totally. Because I, I do the same thing with the factual. Like, let me, you know, let me just beat you over the head with this fact <laughs> right. and, and drive past the fact that you're clearly having an emotional response and I should right. try to at least respect that and give that space. Sure. I'll tell you the level I'm at. And right. I, don't, I don't consider myself like, I think I'm an emotionally... I'm an emotionally intelligent person, yeah. but like, it's like if I stub my toe, right? I've told my my wife will go, "Oh, are you okay?" I've told my wife to not say anything to me <laughs> when I hurt myself, yeah. to stare at me with dead eyes, <laughs> and literally zero emotion, right? And so I'll like I'll cut myself or something. I'll go put a band aid, be like, "Fuck," wash it off, and then I'll like after fifteen or twenty seconds, the pain starts to go away. I'll look over at my wife, who's just staring me dead in the face, not saying anything. I love it. And I'm like, it makes me laugh, and I feel better. There you go. But like dude. when people are like, I don't know, like the emotional response, like it, it definitely kicks something up in me where I'm like, I gotta yeah. come back with like a fucking. Oh right, I get what you're saying. Here's a study. Now. I've memorized four things, sure. well, and that's... I'm gonna hit you with them right now. You see, and that's so I, I like, like you were saying, I'm center. I don't identify with any party. I just don't like things that are like inefficient or like impractical. It's just not sure. It's not what I'm into, right? Um, and I raised my voice. Sorry, I get a little worked up. Oh, you um, saw me going for the dials? No, I. The, you're professional, man. I dig it. Yeah, all but right, but right. my thing is, I just, um, you know what? We really we don't. We can move away from the politics stuff in a second, but we don't actually have a left and right divide in this country. What we really have are people on the internet who are obsessed with their partisan bullshit and the rest of us, and they are trying to force everybody to be like, "You have to care about this. You have to care about that." And it's like, I don't. I just want to fucking like live my life and be able to go to things again. I don't care. I who I do not care who becomes president. I know that I'm a Nazi or evil, or whatever. Like, <laughs> I do not care. You know why? Because they're both fucking the same. When you really think about it, they're not that different. And it, you're you're selling yourself a false reality if you think that either one of them is going to you know save us or change anything. And just go back to doing the thing you did before you thought the world was ending. That's what's going to make your life better. Yeah. I just noticed the don't tread on me tattoo on the side of your face. It looks great, and I, I want to get the name of that guy that did that work because uh, yeah. it does look good. Uh, so this is what I want to talk about. Yeah. And you you said you pulled something up on your phone. Well, you mentioned it, but I, I was researching Sage because I was curious. Like, oh, because, you know, I like— You know nothing about football. That's what you told me well, before. Well, I don't follow it. Like, if, if you and I—if if you um, were like, hey, I got an extra ticket to the Rams, I would be like, fuck yeah, I want to go. Like, I, I enjoy being at sports live. Sure. Or if I'm hanging out with friends, sometimes I'll throw a little money on a game just to, like, make, like 20 bucks. Like, something so there's some— interest but i don't do fantasy i don't follow i don't care who wins um so that's like you know but i i know like i know enough um and so i was researching sage for this episode i wanted to have some info and i saw that he like did did comedy right it's like god it's like of course (laughs) everybody who's remotely famous when they fail at their favorite thing their first thing they always go to comedy as the fail well because i don't know if you know this alex but comedy is just saying words into a microphone there's no skill involved in it it, it doesn't take years of getting your ass kicked you know the the the, the thing i saw I, i'm not supr- i mean i get it that like why not try it right you know and i mean he may- there's no actual hate for the guy I know, like like, like I know. yeah we're, we're we're playing curmudgeons here but the 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 truth of the way i feel is Anytime somebody gets up with a microphone and, and with the intent to tell stand up, yeah. I'm like, you're a stand up. You're a stand up. Mm-hmm. We can talk about it. You're obviously going to eat shit if you've never done it before, never sure. done mics. But like, I'm curious how he did. Well, you know, because the vid, you watched the video. No, I haven't seen it. I okay, did, so I just looked on his Wikipedia. There's a video of him doing stand up. Well, there, here's how you know he did not do well. Oh, okay, because there is a video of him doing stand up and. There's other comics. Steve Ran is easy. Oh, is shit. on the show, yeah. and there's another some other comic that I recognize the name, but a yeah. lower level. Sure. And then Sage <laughs> on the stand up lineup for the show, and they're showing like a four minute like, hey, this happened yesterday at the community center. Oh god! And when they get to the part where he's doing stand up, they just show the video and they're talking over it. Oh my! Like they show god. the other comics <laughs> crushing, <Yeah. laughs> and then they they just like. 
They show the video and different audio. So there's no way. Of course. There's no way he did well. But Yeah, uh, for sure. But it's also like he played professional football. Like the stakes of – like the guy's been like hit by the scariest, biggest men in the country. Over sure. And over. You know what I'm saying? Like, so going and talking to a mic shouldn't be – I mean I know it's a different sort of thing, but it's like he's faced fear in a different way. I'm sure he could do stand-up. Yes, but I have friends that have done multiple tours in Iraq and Afghanistan that are like, I could never do I, I get it. improv. Like, or like, <laughs> like yeah, just stuff like that where I'm like, really, dude? Right. Like, you guys fucking get shot at. Like, that's so much more. But, but it really is like, it, it's a different type of, it's, sure. it's, it's, obviously, it's a very different. Yeah. The, the act of going through something that you're scared of, I, res- I totally respect. Totally. But as comics, it's fun to just shit on people doing it dude, for the first course. time. And especially people who, even though he's a backup quarterback, dude made a ton of money. Yeah. He's doing very well in his non – if he was like like a, like a homeless guy doing yeah. stand-up that someone like caught a photo of five years ago and was like, right. is that Sage Rosenfels doing stand-up? Yeah. He, he pissed his pants. I wouldn't be making fun of him, but he's he's on TV, he's still yeah, on radio shows. I, yeah, I think it's fucking... great to make fun of him. I the only thing I don't like is when comics get very like possessive. It's like, oh, they don't have the right to do comedy, and it's like, fuck you. They, oh, can I curse on here? Sorry. You can, no. t- yes, you can. Even I, I do so many podcasts that I always try to not curse unless it's like this is beside the point. It, it curse. Fucking a. All right. So All right. Yeah. I hate when comics like mostly open micers do this when they see someone like Sage and they can like probably fill a room because they have notoriety and they get very like, mm-hmm. oh, this is a disrespect to the art. And it's like, th- there's there's no respect to the art, you idiot. Like he moved <laughs> tickets, people came to see him, move the fuck on. Yeah, there's business and art have to dance. Yeah, dude. And for some, I, I guess Sage Rosenfels is a draw. I mean, I don't know if, if I was like. Maybe, maybe in his town or wherever it was. If know. I was in a, if I was living in uh, fucking Lake Charles, Louisiana, and right. I saw Sage Rosenfels is doing stand up sure. tomorrow night, I'd be like, I'll go see how what that's like. What a weirdly specific. I remember, like, is that somewhere you're from, Lake Charles, Louisiana? I, li- I lived in Louisiana oh, okay. first, oh, okay. so yeah, I had a okay. place to pull there. Do you remember Bagel Boss? Do you remember this guy? He was like an Instagram celebrity for a second. No. He was just like, it was one of the, this is insane. This relates to stand up. He's like five feet tall, and this video went crazy viral of him screaming at a lady at a bagel restaurant or like a bagel bakery type place for some, I don't know what. He was like having a temper tantrum, and then this grown man, like you're my size, like tackled this guy because he looked like he was about to like start hitting people. So he went crazy viral, got known as the bagel boss, and then he got to headline the Long Island Comedy Club one night. And it was this whole thing where it's like, bagel boss from Instagram. And, <laughs> it, and the video went live. He wore shorts on stage. He had his face painted. It looked like, remember Sting from WCW? Sure, yeah, yeah, It looked yeah. like that. And so once I saw that, I was like, yeah, let's all let everybody do it. Why you not? You know, I remember Charlie Sheen going on a stand-up tour, and the, oh, a, yeah. uh, like a video leaked, and he was just – he's like eating it and like screaming at the audience and on heroin or whatever he was right. doing. And it was just such a – here's the thing. Like people don't respect stand-up, but yeah. those people who like Sage Rosenfels that got up and tried it, they respect it. That's because true. They, they, when he did it that one – Night, October 10th, 2018, with that show. What a glorious evening. He, he felt the flop sweat. Yep. He was like, oh, this is not like reading a cover two defense. This is That's really true. hard. And now when he talks to people, he's like, yeah, it's really, really fucking hard. That's a good point, actually. And like, I, mean, I remember, yeah, because like, if you want people to respect stand up, let them try it. Right. Right. I mean, they're, you know they're not going to do good if they've never if they've never tri- if they've truly never tried it. You know they're not going to. What, what's that for? Is that for Those your are headphones? Because I, I thought I was quiet, and then I realized my headphones were quiet, not what my voice. A professional move. He reached onto my roadcaster and upped his own headphones. Everybody, that was I'm I'm hard. That was well. That was well done. <laughs> Can I, I, I? By the way, I also was thinking. A lot, I wanted to prepare for your show, and I wanted to present my favorite backup quarterback. Would you mind if I gave him a shout out? Could I? Could yeah, I, sure, sure. Uh, I, I just want to give a shout out to Willie Beeman. Um, <laughs> he played for the Miami Sharks. You guys. You know, I'm um, Willie Beeman. Yeah, I keep the ladies. I think arguably the most famous backup quarterback of all time. One of yeah, uh, it's either him or it's uh, uh, Palco from um, 
Uh, oh, no, I'm saying – I guess you're right because who's the guy from The Replacements that Keanu Reeves oh, plays? Oh, yeah. I don't remember, but that guy too. Correct. Okay. But here's the thing. I didn't know his name, so clearly <laughs> right. Willie Beeman – I knew Willie Beeman's song. Right, yeah. Dude, that speech in uh, – was it Any Given Sunday? That's Correct, the yes. The yep. Pacino speech. It's amazing. Yes. Yeah. I listened to it. That's one of my favorite movies. So I love football movies – because mm-hmm. I'm in – like, the game of football is fascinating to me. I really – and I love athletes. Like, pro athletes, I'm, I'm so amazed by what they can do. I just don't sure. – I think what it is with me in sports is I grew up around a lot of guys who were, like, so into the fantasy, like, games and whatever. It was too much. And because I, like, wasn't – like, I just didn't have the interest. They were like, eh, all right. We're, Getlin's not a part of this. And yeah. it just sort of turned me off. Like, I don't mind it. Like, I – you know, and watching an incredible game, fun. But I just don't – care about like oh like rg3 had 10 for the thing the, it's like what, I, whatever well like, i i got out i was doing fantasy for a couple years yeah. and i got out because it did start to feel a little um it, it started to feel a little clickish and it just and it and it yeah, honestly ruined the way that i watch games because as people in this podcast listeners know i love underdogs Oh, yeah. So I like, I literally go like, when I'm watching a game, I'm like, has one of these teams not won a Super Bowl? Is one of these teams 0 and 12? I'm rooting for that team. But when you've got fantasy, you have players on every team. So it changes the way you watch the game. And some people are like, it makes it so much more interesting. But I never gamble. Yeah. And I like rooting for underdogs. So it actually kind of messed with the way that I watch football in a way that I didn't like. Right. That makes sense. Yeah. I just, um, Anyway, but I will say this back to the to the Pacino thing. That speech was incredible. I, it, I don't know. But Billy Bob Thornton's in Friday Night Lights might have been my favorite. Football. I never saw. I never saw the Friday Night Lights really? movie. I watched the show, but I never watched the movie. I never saw the show, but the movie is. I don't want to oversell it, but it's great. Um, yeah, those are my two favorite coach speeches of like any film. I like the coach speech in Rudy. Mm. You remember that one? I mean, I know it's like Rudy. Two, it's like I've, two sentences. I haven't seen it in so long. So, oh, okay. Yeah. Because this is our house. No one comes into our house and pushes us around. You know who my favorite, actually, my favorite film sports coach was the basketball coach from Teen Wolf. Because I, do you remember that movie? (laughs) Yeah. He was such a, he was just like a dead, he's like a divorced dad. Like, I remember like the team was awful. There was like a scene where he's like eating a hard boiled egg, not paying attention, like while they're playing. And then Michael J. Fox becomes the Teen Wolf and like just dominates. And then like, he's like, oh my God, my team is good now. (laughs) That movie sucked. And I, I actually remember t- I remember I remember the sequel better than I remember the uh, original, which is I've never seen the sequel. Well, sequels. Nice. I like t- I have, to be fair. I haven't seen Team Wolf in like probably twenty years, but yeah, I think it was good when I saw it. But Maybe. also, who knows? Who knows that that stuff? Sometimes stuff holds up, and like yeah. a show that uh, one that holds up really well is the Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movie from nineteen eighty nine. Nice. Um, there's like zero CGI in it. So they, it's just yeah. like short men doing karate in turtle costumes. It's really funny. It's also like eighties, early nineties, dark. Like, mm. like they didn't know how to make like a kids action movie yet. So right. there's there's scenes where like people get murdered horrifically, and they're just like Whoop, whoops, and you're like, <laughs> I watched this when I was five. It's That's so, crazy. It's so funny. I haven't. I mean, I've seen those. I remember that, and they went to like China or Japan for the second one, right? Yeah, but. Everything after the first, well, so I, the second one is the Secret of the Ooze, and that's where oh, like Kevin okay. Nash, the wrestler, so, is Shredder. So that's in America. They went to Asia for one of them. Maybe yes, the third I think one. the third one. Okay, um, the Secret of the Ooze. All of those, all of those tonally are completely different. Yeah, it's just the first okay. movie, I'll and I'll rewatch it. Yeah, and like, I remember I, I, I read a story or an article about how it was made, and it was like it was kind of shot like an indie movie. Like they made it for like under twenty million dollars or something. Yeah. So they, the stories about them running out of budget and how, like, the costumes were malfunctioning halfway through and how they had to kind of, like, improvise while shooting to make it happen. But it is uh, – Talk about your underdog story, right? Oh, my God, dude. I mean, it's such a good – I mean, there's a part in that movie where the turtles are at a – they're at an old farmhouse. Yeah. And uh, Raphael is injured, so he's in a bathtub. And uh, April O'Neil's washing his shell – slowly oh my God. and they're sketching each other and fixing cars <laughs> and doing meditative like yeah. uh ritual summoning of their of splinter right and you're like what the fuck kind of movie is it like they just went to a farmhouse for 15 minutes yeah of the it's literally like a huge chunk of the movie is just them like collecting their chi before they go back to Make, like to fight shredder to fight shredder 
Didn't Shredder have like an army of teenage ninjas? Like 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 yeah, humans. Sam, Sam Rockwell. He was one of them. His first movie is the the Ninja Turtles movie. Which is he Shredder? No, he's the kid. Oh, I was he's gonna, like a kid. I was gonna say, yeah, he's one of the punks. He's like that makes sense. Right. And then like Splinter is like because Shredder's like a buff, like macho dude, right? No, he's like a he's like a agile Asian man. Oh, I thought he was like you're like, you're, you're confusing the shitty ones that came after the uh, first Turtles movie. Shredder's okay. like he's like a he's like a man from somewhere in Asia that does karate, and Splinter was his rat. And his, and he was like mimicking the karate while his master was doing it, and then he gets in the ooze, right? And like it, him and the turtles grow, oh. but it's like it's a revenge so where's, story. Where's the ooze from? Do we know? Does that it the, doesn't matter. the justification like, is like so one day we were walking, and was, there was ooze. <laughs> there was ooze. <laughs> Wait, which one had Vanilla Ice? That must have been the sequel. Dude, you have to watch the first. You're, you're, I'm going to go back and rewatch it. Yes. You're, okay. you're, you're pulling all stuff from the shitty one. Like, um, okay. The, the I, jokey one. This one is like, what? it's a gritty okay. New York all right. movie. Got it. I don't know why I'm getting so fired up about this. You're very passionate about this film. I, originally, when I was thinking of podcasts to do, I was going to yeah. do a podcast where I just made the guest watch the first Ninja Turtles movie, and we talk about it over and over again. Two of my friends have a podcast called Series Finale, and every episode they re- they review a different last episode of the oh series. Oh, my God. Hey, Liz, you got to come out here for a second. You got to repeat that yeah, to my wife. It's a great. It's so she, funny. She's going to laugh. Are you coming? Well, this is, this is great. Oh, there we go. Okay, so I was saying two of my friends, they're very funny. I don't know if they still do, but they have a podcast called Series Finale, okay. where every episode they review a different series finale of like all different kinds of shows. So, yeah. like West Wing, Sopranos. Is this was this what our idea was? Say by the had Bell. We had a, what our idea was. We had an idea to watch the last five minutes of a we show. We had an or idea to watch, watch like the last scene of a TV series we never watched. And we would call it spoiler alert, and then we would say what we think happened the rest of the series. You still do it? Why not? Right, that was it. You can go back to this. Sorry. Well, I don't know. I, I thought I thought you'd be more fired up about that. That was our idea. Well, they did the whole episode, but was, oh, okay, yeah. But it was the last episode of a series. Well, guys, this has been great. <laughs> Liz, get out of here. <laughs> uh, we we have another idea for a show called Coral Teen, where okay. every we've been having a lot of fights mm-hmm. in quarantine. I love it. So every show we. Go through one of our fights. Yeah. We have a guest as a referee. And then at the end of the show, the referee decides who actually was right. And whenever we keep you, a whenever you start this, Rachel and I both would love to ref this show. That would be so Dual funny. refs. Yes. Dual refs. I love yeah. it. Or even, I, or even we'll do like a spinoff episode where like I'll coach you and she'll coach Liz. And then we like have you guys – and then we'll have like an f- extra person to like ref it, right? But it's like – where, like, your counter, like, tag team argue, right? Yeah. The first fight on Quarrel Team will be Liz's reaction to you telling her spoiler alert <laughs> five seconds ago. Because you had fight? you had no reaction to it. Can you take it back? No, you're off mic. I can't. You're off mic. It's they can't okay. hear you right now. See, I love is, you. Eric, this is why guys like you and me just need a little money because we have all these ideas and you know how much work this takes. And if you can just hire someone to just, hey, set it up. I'm going to show up. I'm going to talk. I'm going to go home. And they just do the rest. It, God, I mean, like, that's all I want. Yeah, yeah. I don't need stuff. I don't want a fancy house. I, you know, I don't You need... don't want a job in a writer's room. Fuck that. You, yes. I want 38 podcasts. Yes. <laughs> I just want one or two people that just work for me full time that I'm like, I'm just going to show up, do the creative part, and I pay you guys handsomely to do everything else. Yeah, absolutely. It's a dream. It's the dream. It's doable. It's just going to take time. Yeah. Um, we're doing it right now. I, uh, I want to – there's something I did want to read to you. Please. Um, this, uh, this made my day. So I found a review from the comedy show that, he, that oh, Sage did. Hell yeah. So again, this is for Late Night Tailgate. It's a good name. October 10th, 2018. Uh, this is on Gold Star. Gary Huber attended. I don't know who Gary Huber is, but this is a review from Gary Huber. He gave it three out of five stars. Sounds honest. He wrote, This team of four hasn't been together long, and it showed. Not much chemistry. <laughs> Steve and Sarah were good early. Sage didn't bring much. And I'm surprised the radio personality wasn't more entertaining. They weren't bad. A nice night out. The best bit was, can you put this on an NFL jersey? All right. I mean... That doesn't sound – look, yeah, to fine. say that he didn't bring much is great. Sure, yeah, absolutely. Like, I would have thought it was like Steve and Sarah were good early on. Sage Rosenfels 
forgot every joke, got mad, yeah. threw the microphone into the crowd, and started acting out plays from high school. I wonder if he like did mics and stuff to prep. But... That would be – this would be the question that if we ever had him yeah. on. But, well, it's funny, too, yeah. that bit now. Like, hearing – because that was in 2018. That mm-hmm. I don't, You know, I could imagine the humor of, can you put this on an NFL jersey? And then now they're, like, allowing them to put their, like, favorite protest slogan or whatever. Is sure. That, right? Isn't that a thing? That is a so, thing. So it's like – you couldn't really, the joke wouldn't work the same anymore because everybody would immediately think like, oh, what are, what cause are you supporting? Yeah, a lot of things wouldn't work from two years ago. Yeah, God, it's just like <laughs> it's a different world, man. Um, Ugh, I know. Let me. Now here's what we're gonna do next. I uh, I wrote some roast jokes. I love it. And uh, I uh, who, who are we roasting? We're roasting Sage Rosenfels. Oh, that makes sense. Duh. Yeah, yeah. So let me pull it up here for you, and then we'll... Uh... And I was like, are you roasting me? <laughs> no. <laughs> Wouldn't that be shitty? Maybe. Hey, I... man, I wrote some jokes about your fucking face. <laughs> I didn't have any time to prepare. Thanks for coming over, man. Oh, you didn't You didn't <laughs> write roast jokes about me, assuming we do this? No, so we're going to roast Sage Rosenfels. Um, I've got the Google Doc up here, so you can just scroll down. I'm going to oh, tell you. And I've it. got your name next to the ones you're going to tell. Oh, I'm just perfect, gonna start. perfect, perfect. Okay. So let me know when you're on. You're, I'm you're good. good. Yeah. All right. The roast of Sage Rosenfels. Roasting Sage Rosenfels is hard. Not because he's relatively unknown, but because anytime someone named Helwig roasts someone named Rosenfels, it sounds like a war crime. That is hilarious. Well, I'm going to zoom in just a tag because my eyes are not great. Okay, here we go. In high school, uh, oh, sorry. In high school, Sage was an amazing athlete. In fact, he lettered in football, basketball, baseball, tennis, track, and having a 45-year-old man's face when he was 17. He's not a good-looking guy. I love it. Sage has played on teams with problematic names. He played on the controversial Washington Redskins, the rapey-sounding Vikings, and the also-rapey Dolphins. However, nothing was worse than his high school, the St. Peter's Pedophiles. Go, Feely Friars! Fun fact. In 2007, the magazine Sporting News predicted Sage Rosenfels would be the breakout quarterback of the year. The prediction was submitted by a one-time guest contributor to the publication, Blaze Frozen Pels. <laughs> Never found Blaze uh, writing anything after that. Is it clear that it's him with a fake name? I think that's clear. I think yeah. we got it. We All got right. it. Yeah, yeah. All right, we got it. It's better when you uh, <laughs> explain it. Rosenfels actually started doing stand-up since retiring. He's pretty good, too. He plays a character on stage that sweats a lot, has CTE, and tags every joke with his signature catchphrase, what else? That's, that might be my favorite one so far. That's good. And that, yeah, that's kind of inside comedy, maybe, but it's, yeah, yeah, yeah. it's great. It's great. In 2018, Sage performed comedy with Steve Renazizi, the comic who lied about being in the World Trade Center on 9-11. After the show, Renazizi said the biggest lie he'd ever told was actually an hour earlier when he in- introduced Sage Rosenfels as a comedian. <laughs> All right. The good news is that while Sage's comedy was unwatchable, it was the first time there was a horrifying disaster and Steve Ranazizi was actually in the building. That's funny. That's <laughs> really good. All right. Sage hits the radio circuit pretty hard in recent years. They say some people have a face for TV. Some people have a face for radio. And others like Sage have a face for a crow magnet man frozen in the ice. Yeah, again, he's got a very defined chin. Uh, Sage Rosenfels got back to back to Maria in 2011. He was placed on IR, effectively end, ending his career. In fact, doctors told him his only chance for recovery was to retire, start working in TV, then randomly start touring with the guy that lied about 9-11. It's funny. Uh, it's hard to quantify how terrible Sage Rosenfels' comedy is, but to put it in context, picture the difference between Jim Carrey's comedy and Jim Carrey's paintings. Then picture the difference between Jim Carrey and Sage Rosenfels. <laughs> Sage Rosenfeld's football career is like the movie Rudy, a tale of overcoming a relative lack of talent with hard work and determination and eventually getting a moment in the sun and holding your own. Sage's comedy career is like my friend Rudy, this guy I know that got kicked out of an open mic for pissing his pants on stage. <laughs> All right. Sage go. has been roasted. And uh, with that, too, uh, you know, we've been talking a lot about Sage. We also mentioned uh, our Beeman. friend Willie Beeman. I like throwing it back with yes. these uh, older. Let's do it. Quarterbacks, and we actually are going to do that right now with a bit we do on the show here called On This Day. So enjoy. Welcome back to another edition of On This Day in Backup History. Today we visit 2014, not to see George Clooney and Monument Men, but for a backup quarterback. Jordan Palmer, 
a career backup and the younger brother of successful NFL quarterback Carson Palmer, recently began working at Exos, a training center for quarterbacks bound for NFL glory. In similar news, Bill Clinton's brother, Dougie Clinton, has a free Zoom class tonight called How I Became the President. Some light comedy there. I, I like uh, the music. It's good, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I, I bought it. Smart move. You got to own everything if you're going to put it up because oh, we just oh, got I'm, on Spotify. I'm aware. With, with yeah. The podcast. They'll, so. they'll, they'll rip it down right away. Yeah. I know. I have, I've read horror YouTube stories. YouTube also. I got, I, I got, really? Some, yeah. So I used to do like little in between um, segments with my show with Rachel and I would play like bits of songs and YouTube would flag it immediately. I got, I did it like, and it was only like a few seconds, but I did one from Run the Jewels, a few other ones, and they were just yeah. like, they're, they, um, anyway, so just, yeah, smart, you bought it. With YouTube, I'm telling myself that it's okay for me to um, use the NFL clips because it's like it's fair use because I'm talking about them, so it's yeah. like commentary. But uh, if they pulled all my shit down tomorrow, I would not it, be surprised. It's not clear. It depends. And even people yeah. who work at YouTube I've talked to, they also said it's not – sometimes you can like dispute stuff and they'll – because I, I, I have a friend who was doing a podcast and he interviewed a musician – uh, or like a band or something and played the song and they pulled that video because they didn't have like the rights and he's like dude the guy who made the song is on my show and it, it was like a whole process to, that's like, so weird it's just like the algorithms and shit like that but yeah because like i got i have my friend's band yeah. that's on spotify that gave me music that's appeared in a couple episodes yeah. previous i wonder if they could do the same thing even yeah. though it's like he's literally like hey man use this one yeah but like, there, there's a whole way that you have to go through it and honestly oh it's not God. it's not worth the headache Unless the show is about your friend's band, it's not. Don't. Yeah, because I'm gonna. I'm gonna ha- he's writing an intro song for me. Well, if it's if he doesn't appear anywhere else, you're fine. But if it already lives somewhere else, that's where it gets tricky. Gotcha. Oh wow. Okay. Because if it's already on Spotify, as mm-hmm. like, hey, this is my music, and then it Spotify's algorithm like catches it somewhere yeah. else, they'll flag it, and then they have to review it, and there's a whole process. Well, in that case, his music is not on Spotify. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Fuck. All right. Well, we'll figure that shit out later. Um, you know what's funny is I have these bits that I do on the show, and I'm yeah. always like, do the first bit 15 minutes in. This is the second week in a row I fucking forgot, so right. I'm just going to play these bits back to back. Yeah, do it. Why not? We're, we're bit heavy in the, towards the end of the podcast. I, I dig here. it. All right, well, we're going to go for a second bit here. Now, uh, listeners of the show will know that um, when these backups get on the road, Alex gets a little lonely. Yeah. And uh, sometimes they write home. I wonder what that sounds like. Bring in the Backups presents Letters Home from the Bench, November 15th, 1990. Rusty Hilger writes, My dear Hillary, my previous letters made mention of my vexation that the coach refuses to elevate me above my competitor, Jeffrey Scott George. My weariness has only grown, I'm afraid, as Jeffrey has the arm of a union cannon, but the leadership intangibles of a child-loving town deviant. Even last week, I purchased ale for the large men on my offensive line, hoping to ingratiate myself to these brave bulwarks and in hope of replacing Jeff George myself. I ache for the field, Hillary, but fear she may never call my name as long as I live. Give my best to our boys. Go Colts. (laughs) It's a little sad, right? I don't mean it to be sad, but... I think it's funny. All right. It reminds me of, like, a Ken Burns documentary. Well, I... To write these, I uh, I did watch a bunch of things where they read letters, yeah. and it's always so heartbreaking. I think that's why I'm sad because I'm like thinking oh, of thinking of actual war letters. No, because it's always people being like, "What I do for this country, right. paid in blood, will never make me miss you or the children any less." Tell my and then like the, the guy at the end always goes, "The next day, Corporal Johnson was." Blown to smithereens <laughs> right, at Gettysburg, and you're yeah. like, like, you're like oh, it's, man. it never ends with them being like, and they made it home, right? Yeah, right. they always pick the dudes that died the day they wrote it. That's I'll, probably how they got the letter is that somebody made sure that, like, the guy died, and then it was like, we better hold on to this letter. This, like, this is his last thing he wrote. If it was the guy that just came home, they 
destroyed the letters because he was probably like you know beating the shit out of his <laughs> wife and it was like not worthy to remember. He's got like horrible PTSD. Yeah, from the Civil yeah, War. It's like yeah. not good. Uh-huh. The Civil War was crazy, dude. Yeah, it's gonna be crazy when it happens. <laughs> dude, the I'll sequel's stop. gonna be way worse. No, it's gonna be people just complaining at each other. It's gonna be look the te- the, the tepidness of whatever comes next. Can, I'm, listen, for, uh, jokes aside, like violence is terrible, but really, it's just gonna be people trying to cancel each other. You yeah, know, yeah, be like, oh, I'm gonna get you fired, and it's like, all right, you know. Whatever. I'm so humiliated that this little tangent started with me saying the Civil War was crazy. <laughs> I, that is truly, I have to say, this is five episodes in. That's yeah. the most humiliatingly stupid thing I've ever said on a podcast. Well, you know. The Civil War was crazy. <laughs> Thanks, podcast hosts. Yeah. Appreciate Hot that. take, Eric. <laughs> Cancer's you know what? bad. I don't fucking hold back from anything. The Civil War was crazy. <laughs> what if I was like, no, it was wonderful. I, yeah. speak, I speak truth to power, all right? That's what I do. Yeah. Um, where did you grow up? Outside of D.C., in Virginia. Okay, because that's where I lived for high mm-hmm. school. Where so like what neighborhood? In Fredericksburg, Virginia. It's about an hour south. Of okay, DC, yeah, right yeah. off ninety five. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I think we talked about this maybe yeah, in your podcast. Yeah. I did a trade show there. Oh, really? Yeah, they have. Wait, a, the, remind me. The, the, the Fredericksburg Convention Center. Maybe I don't know. I know that when I was a kid, we went to a Civil War reenactment once. And uh, like my grandpa was visiting, my dad was like, "Let's do like a thing." We went, and we were even my at the time. My dad was like, "This was why would I want to watch mass death re- reenacted? This is yeah. stupid." Well, that's like when I was so when I was working in Fredericksburg, I was working for a timeshare company in Colonial Williamsburg. So that's like all that that was. Right. Want to see what it was yeah. like to yeah. not have TV or <laughs> medicine and use yeah. leeches and what war felt like? Right. So yeah, that was like the whole. That was the. Did we go to Jamestown. Yeah. yeah, I used to sell day t- day tickets to Jamestown. Yeah, that was like my whole pitch is I'd be like, uh, "Hey, do you want two tickets to Jamestown? Come in for this ninety minute presentation where we pressure you right. with these horrific sales practices that you'll feel <laughs> bad about selling to people ten years later when you go to therapy." That's so funny. That's basically, but yeah, it was that that experience you're talking about, like Civil War reenactments, stuff like that. That was that was my my job was selling that right. for a year. Do you think that made you? Um, favor underdogs. You were always kind of an underdog trying to sell your way into whatever. Mm, that's such a nice take on me helping people lose their money on timeshare. <laughs> I really appreciate it. <laughs> I don't know. I'm just trying to see the through line here. You know, I mean, everybody loves underdogs. Who doesn't love underdogs? But but my only thing is, just because- a lot of people don't. Well, a lot of people are front running douchebags. They're called Dallas Cowboys fans. Or that's fair. I'll know people who are yeah. like they're from, uh, you know, they're from. Maine, and they're like, I'm like, what are your favorite teams? They're like, I like the Dallas Cowboys, the Los Angeles Lakers, oh, yeah. whoever won in hockey last year. Like, they're just like, are the Cowboys good again? I know they were bad. For no, a they're while. terrible. Oh, okay. But they were, but they, they were like owned the '90s, right? For people that are our age, yeah. if you were a front runner, yeah, you love the Dallas Cowboys, right. and you don't watch them anymore. When I was a kid, I remember it was all like Yankees, Cowboys, Chicago Bulls. Like those were the three teams of the '90s that just crushed yeah. everything. Well, especially the Bulls. I mean, the yeah. Bulls were of course. insane. Yeah. Complete domination. But, yeah, I you asked about, like, did the timeshare thing give me, like, a through line? And I realized that, like, there's an element of – there's a little bit of that in stand-up. We're selling ourselves. Yeah, but also, like, connecting with people. Yeah. For sales and for stand-up, you have to tap in to get them to have an emotional response for it to actually work. Yes. You that's have a- to figure out how to make them emotionally invested or you're not going to get them. I used to say, like, if somebody was being an asshole, I'm not proud of them. This is so shameful. This would yeah. be worse than saying the Civil War was crazy. <laughs> I can't wait. I, I, if somebody was being dismissive to me, like a, like a, like a parent, yeah. um, and they had their kids there, and they're like, yeah, yeah, thanks, guy. We, uh, we're not going to Colonial Williamsburg. I'd be like, well, your kids seem excited. Maybe you're just not a parent that likes doing things for your kids. <laughs> like, I would say stuff like that, and they'd how, be like, hold, and I'd be, I would just go into my pitch. How often did that backfire on you? I mean, backfire, it's like it doesn't matter. Right, because they were already going to say no anyway. And so, it wasn't, yeah, that's and true. here's the thing, like, this is, uh, to, to give a little context, I was traveling yeah. across the East Coast, yeah. flying to different cities, and going to travel shows where, like, the idea was everybody here is selling, you know, the Bahamas or whatever right. little vacation package. So, sure. like, people that were walking down my aisle had just been pitched, yeah. you know, 10, like, it wasn't like I, I was, it. like, surprising them. Sure. So, yeah, but I was also an asshole. I was like, if somebody's going to show me their ass, I'm going to yeah, go. why not? I don't have good de-escalation when it comes to people making me mad. I think I'd said before I have, like, good emotional intelligence. Right. I have good emotional intelligence when someone's upset. 
I can usually do a good job of like I get what you're saying, comforting yeah. them. You know, like I'm good with yeah. partners. I'm good with my wife. Um, I'm good with my siblings in that way. When someone pisses me off. Dude, I just go to – I'm, it. like, ready to fight, and it's like I'm not a fighter. Like, I would get my ass kicked, but most people don't want to go. So it's like yeah. I've just given myself permission to act like has that. Has it ever gotten to that point where it has – It almost did a couple weeks ago. I was walking my dog. Yeah. Like, two blocks up. I have a – everybody here knows, but – and you do too because he's right here. I have a pit yeah. bull. I'm walking my dog. He's on somebody's yard. But, like, just, just walking. Like, I'm not, like, taking him through someone's flower bed. <laughs> right. And some dude in a Range Rover right off the bat. Yeah. Guy in a Range Rover – Pulls up next to me on the side of the street, maybe like eight feet away from me, and goes like, that dog's on my lawn. I just look at him. I didn't say anything, but like the subtext like, yeah, I'm walking my dog. And he's like, get your pit bull off my lawn. I'll get out of the car. (laughs) Like he's going to come kick my ass. Sure. And the, the thing I said, I don't know why this was like the thing I went to. Well, you have to kill both of us. Yeah. Like, I just, like, sure. just accelerate into it. the conflict. And it's, like, just so, like, he could have a gun. Like, yeah, I gotta, that... it's a part of my personality that I'm, like, I'm really trying to work on because it gets you in, I've, I, it gets I, you in trouble. I, so, I, when I was younger, was more prone to that. I'm way better about it now. I've actually never been in a fight, like, in life. I've, I've done some, like, light sparring with, like, boxing and jujitsu and stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and that was enough to remind me, like, yeah, this could happen in the real world, but, like, ten times worse. Like, I've been hit full force in the face with a boxing glove. And, like, that, with a 16-ounce glove, even that was, like, dude, fuck this. Like, I'm going to tell yeah, jokes. Yeah, I don't yeah. want that. Yeah, and But but I I have to remember this, you know, moment. Like, it's rare that I'll get to that, but there's there's that part of you that's like, I don't know. Fuck it. Let's well, try so, let's, let's, let's uh, dance, baby. Let's go. You want you know? to step outside? Yeah. I mean, you do have a pit bull. Like, I feel like, <laughs> I feel like Gordon, he's a little older, but I think he would step up. You I know? think, he, I hope he would step up. I don't know. He's, he's a shelter dog. I feel like once he hangs out with friends for 10 minutes, he's like, these are my new owners. He's very mellow. Very chill dog. Yeah. But, he's, I, but, he, I, but I've seen him get a, like, he'll get a little aggressive around bigger dogs, or like huskies sometimes. Yeah. And I'm like, he looks like he could fuck some shit up. So, but it's not like he was shitting on the guy's lawn. No, dude, I was literally just walking him. Yeah. But, like, that's not – I'd say, like, one in ten interactions I'll have with people. Like, yeah. if you're just walking down the street, people sure. come the other direction. One in ten interactions is just people being like, ugh, like, jumping away from him. I've had people say stuff to me. Like, you know, they don't let – they don't let – you had those dogs in uh, in London. <laughs> Terrible dogs. Like, I've had people say that shit to I my face. Like, God bless America. I almost like, fought that guy at a coffee shop, yeah. like, six months ago. Like, somebody shitting on my dog – to me, for no reason. Yeah, pe- people really are like all or nothing on pit bulls. It's weird. It's very weird, and it's. I think it's changing though. I think like they're getting like a whatever. There's a lot of videos about Michael how Vick. Really, uh, you know, he kind of brought that back into this. You know, he. To be honest, obviously you feel bad for those dogs, but that helped because people were like they saw how fucking abused mm, those dogs were. Right. The people think they're like, oh yeah, these dogs are trained to fight. It's like. Yeah, they're not oh. trained. That's abuse. Yeah, of course. And you have to understand that these dogs could just as easily be trained to do anything another dog would do and be, you know, they're like very sweet dogs, generally well, speaking. Well, you know, back in the, I learned this back in the day. People used to actually have pit bulls as like guard dogs for kids. So and like, nanny dogs. Yeah, you knew this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Like right. in the Great Depression. Yep. yep. Like, yeah, like there's like all these photos of, like, I mean, you just think of the little rascals. They got, sure. a, they got a pit bull watching the kids. In I mean, that it show. makes sense. Like dogs don't. They're not like wild animals with those attack you. Like they have something has to train that or someone rather has to train them to do that. Yeah, and there's also a reason that he's a dog and not a wolf. It's because right. he's descended from dogs that used to come close to people when they had fires. That's mm. how they stop becoming wolves. So even pit bulls, you can say, Oh, they're bred for this. It's like, nah, dude, if it's a dog and it's treated well, you're giving it a chance to treat people well. Right. Like it's really it's like people. You gotta treat them as individuals. I'm on my soapbox. I get it. You know, it's whatever. the the point The point I was trying to make is, I got a. I, I have been in my my most recent fight was in college, so I would have been like like ten years ago. I wish, uh, twenty one. So like I was fourteen years ago. Okay. Um, and it was like a one punch thing, but like when I was growing up as yeah. a kid, I was in a new school every year until eighth grade. Mm. And I was small for my grade, so there was definitely years where I was getting in fights and getting bullied and, like, picked on and yep. had to stick up for myself. So, like, I think that's what it – like, I think that's the core of it is I'm, like, 
I'd True. rather get my ass kicked than have somebody think they can talk to me like that. Like, I, I'm never, I get it. I'm never going to start with somebody and be like rude. Or if I do something yeah. that's untoward, I'll like apologize right away. It's when someone just comes at me with that it. energy. Yeah. I can't. That's why I think cops need to do yoga before they go out. <laughs> like, seriously, I'm not even kidding. Like, just it. fucking yoga. I, try, I know a fair number of cops and. Yeah, we don't have to get into the cop thing too much, but you're you're on the right track. There's, it's like I think we should pay them like three times as much and make the training incredibly difficult to pass. Yeah, that's the best way to weed people out. Is just yeah. to have like a it's a fucking uh, like if we talk about this too long, I'm just going to start talking about the wire and the game, and you're going to know that I'm basing everything I, off of a show I watched 15 years it's ago. Just, it's just funny that like so I don't have a a pit bull, but. Um, I didn't like. I know people are afraid of them, but I didn't realize like strangers feel like entitled to just be like, "Hey, your dog." Sucks. Yes, dude. And there's a thing where like, um, if the dog like does something weird, like there's like stories of people just like shooting people's pit bulls, like being like worried that the dog. It's like it's, I'm gonna I'm gonna make if you do that, you the human execution on the spot, no trial. Like fuck. That. I mean, I don't <laughs> really mean that, but like still, that is so disgusting, it's, dude. Like it's one of those things. Like the more you look into it, the more you're like, Ugh, it's. You really do become like when you have a pit bull, you have to become an right. advocate for the dog because sure. people will. Like I had a do- I was at the fucking doctor, like a general care person that I went to go see, and he was like, "Oh yeah, what even up to?" I was like, "Oh, I had to take my dog to the vet." He was like, "Oh, what kind of dog? Pit bull? Ooh, vicious dogs." And I was like, "No, they're not." I just I was like, "No, they're not, man." I, like I, I, I wonder- showed him a photo of my dog. I'm like. So that I mean, seriously, I think people are just manipulated or like buying into media crap that they see. And I wonder yeah. if we're going to look back on the, how we talk about pit bulls now, the way that we think about how like, like you know, I, I remember hearing about like when my parents were kids, they learned in history class that like Native Americans were savages and shit like that. And yeah, yeah. And then, yeah. then you know, time goes on. It's like, oh, that was like pretty disgusting. And then it's like, if we'll look back, like yeah, pit bulls, they're not the monsters we thought. It's they were. definitely like the, like the act of judging the dog by the breed is definitely analogous to racism in that way. I mean, it's, it's not quite as bad, but it's, it's of course not, no, yeah, it's. I mean, I do I mean, like the Civil War was crazy. <laughs> generally speaking, I like dogs more than people, but yes, racism is worse. I also think that, but also I think uh, like you read about the way like the the breed they call it breedism. Yeah. Um, the way it works is like it switches every twenty years. There's like a new uh, ire of people. Like during the uh, World War II, it was German Shepherds, and then it was oh, like Jesus. Rottweilers. Yeah. Yeah. And if you watch movies from the from like the 80s 90s the bad dogs are always like dobermans or rottweilers interesting and there's st- and pitbulls are still considered like i do remember friendly dogs remember beethoven yes that, it's it's and the, the dobermans were the bad dogs in that movie yes absolutely it'd be and, funny if it got to like some absurd breed right that like is like harmless but they're just fucking annoying like like yorkies or something like there's some oh my sort God. of it would be uh it would be uh chihuahuas would be the pretty bad they, yeah they are a little mean but here's the thing i'm doing the exact same thing i, know, I was right? just saying i'm sure there's sweet chihuahuas i got a little dog thing i don't love little dogs yeah they're annoying no disrespect some of them are cute but they're they're definitely like not as fun they're not as fun. Dude, Gordon was also he came over here, he's like putting his head in my lap. I, like he's playing like around. it's like a dude. He's yeah. like he weighs seventy pounds. Yeah. Like we get in, like he comes into bed at night and like pushes me over with his paws. It's like there's a person there. He's got a face like an old man. Yeah. I don't know. To me, big dog just make me feel the bigger the dog, the more of a dog it is. Yeah. For sure. When it's a little dog, I'm like, this is a dog until there's an apocalypse, and then it's food <laughs> for the big dog. Yeah, dude, totally. Yeah, like if if your dog can't you, if your dog can't kind of turn back into a wolf when you need him to. That's that's funny. That, <laughs> I, know, feel I see like a people dog hiking with these little like frou frou dogs in Griffith Park, and I was like, dude, there are coyotes everywhere. Like this is a ba- like this is this could end very badly for you. I've, I've had this talk with Liz. I don't know if Gordon could take a coyote. If it's a coyote sneaking up on him. Yeah, but there. Have you seen one in person? They're smaller than Gordon. They wouldn't. They they would at worst growl at him. They can't. They, they he's too big. I mean, if there's a pack of them, if there's a pack of them. He's going down. Yeah. But if he's just if Gordon's just one on one with a coyote, I feel like he's taking him. Yeah, I th- yeah. I don't think I think one on one a coyote would just back down. Like they if they have to fight. I'm dog fighting. I'm mentally <laughs> dog fighting my dog against the coyote. Who wins? Well, here's the thing. I guess truly size doesn't matter because the coyote lives in the wild. If he's just made it to adulthood. He's gone through some real shit. Well, I will say this. Gordon is a rescue. Okay. We don't know. The only thing we knew about him when we got him is his name used to be Gucci, and he's from <laughs> South Central L.A. Gucci. So, yeah, so that gives me a little bit wow. of a clue as to what his life was like. <laughs> sure. But we don't know. They said that his original owners gave him up. Yeah. Um, 
He's very mellow. I, you know, some dogs you can see like the the fear in their eyes when you, when you show up. And yeah, he was yeah, just yeah. like, "Oh, what's up, man?" Yeah, he was chill when we went to the um uh whatever the no kill shelter and yeah. found him. Yeah, they kept trying to push old dogs on us. Yeah, no thanks. I feel bad for the dogs, but it's like that's a lot. Man. Yeah, they're like they're like, no, this dog's got a lot of life, and the dog's like over in the corner, like finishing his will. Like, <laughs> yeah. like these old he's ass. like shitting in a diaper. Oh my right? god! Yeah, yeah he's <laughs> got like one eye. Yeah, it's no, they uh, they really push those senior dogs. I, I if I, I we talk about like you know when once we give up on our dreams, moving to a place like in Montana or some not Montana, just somewhere not in a New not, York or not LA, Louisiana, not Louisiana, yeah, Lake Charles, yeah. Uh, and having, like, a bunch of dogs. That'd if I had, cool. like, a big property and I could have, like, yeah. six or seven dogs, I'd be like, give me your fucking senior dogs. I would I'll do bury, that. I'll bury some dogs this year. I would do that if I could hire – if I had the money to hire someone to pick up their shit and feed them. I would just, like, play with them and then have someone else do so the you work. Need, you need to hire somebody to run your podcast yes. and clean up your dog shit. And Eric, bury them when they die because they're senior dogs and Eric, you're rescuing one a week. I'm three podcasts to work on the boring <laughs> stuff. I'm, I'm doing it to do the fun part and then offload the other shit. To, yeah, yeah, to, no, I, I get it. I'm, I'm, listen, I'm going to create jobs, America, all right? I'm going to try and hire people. I'm going to boost the economy. Uh, there's nothing funnier than poor people talking about creating <laughs> I know, jobs, but I, I appreciate the effort. <laughs> No, I, it's a dream. It's a our, yeah. Our dream is to give forever homes to senior dogs. I get that. That's sweet. Yeah, and that's what we want to do. I mean, nobody wants them. They need something. You know, like it's. I mean, even if he's got, even if you could get that dog for a week, and that last week, it's could, great. It's beautiful. It's yeah. such a beautiful thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, we're definitely stretching the term forever. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the short term. Yeah, they like hand you a shovel as you're walking. Like, right. You're gonna need this. He's gonna <laughs> die on the way home. Uh, but yeah. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> but it is a sweet thing, and we told I totally encourage people to do it if you have like the means and like the emotional wherewithal to do it. Yeah, don't just do it, and leave it in a kennel. Like you have to like play with the dog, it, it and play with the dog, feed the dog. You know, yeah. Look, man, uh, we're at a hour over an hour, so we should probably uh, yeah yeah I call gotta, it here. I got to run to this other podcast anyway, but this is great. This is really fun. It's really fun, and uh, yeah, well, I'm sure we'll have you back. Yeah, All right, brother. See you soon. Bye. Thanks for listening to the show. To hear more Bring in the Backups or help us grow, please subscribe on iTunes or Apple Podcasts and leave a written five-star review. Or subscribe and hit the notification bell on YouTube. For info on the show or how to see Eric live, visit erichelwig.com to hop on the newsletter.